Well, thank you very much, Lynn, for that very objective history of um, <laughs> behavioral neurosciences in the 30s and 40s. And of course, that's only partly a joke. Lynn and I were, right from the beginning, very, very, um, very committed uh, to a particular story. And part of the story I'm going to tell you is against the background of, of, of really, frankly, the, the skepticism that greeted many of the ideas that Dostrovsky and I put forward and Lynn and I put forward. OK, so um, let me see how this goes. So I wanted to tell you, um, Lynn has already given you an idea of what the world would look like to an, your average behavioral neuroscientist around 1970. And I want to pick up the story there and give you some idea of um, how we saw it and also um, how Jim saw it at the time and, 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 and the interaction be between us. Lynn has already alluded to the, um, the HM story that was developed by Brenda Milner and Sue Corkins. so I won't tell you anything about it. But except to say, when I decided to leave the amygdala, having developed some of the techniques for recording from single units and freely moving animals, it was a no-brainer. I was going to go into the hippocampus. I was going to go and see what memories looked like. Of course, it doesn't necessarily turn out that way. And as you already heard, it's not at all clear why Jim, and I think he has to tell us why he went into the hippocampus. Of course, not only were Bob Isaacson and people like that at Michigan, but Jim Olds was there. And of course, Jim Olds was stuffing microwires uh, into areas like the hippocampus. And it's hard for me to think that Jim wasn't influenced a bit by that. He had also done some impedance work, as you heard from Charles, in the subiculum. So I think at the end of this, Jim will tell us why did he go into the hippocampus in those early days. Anyway, I knew why I went in there. And um, it was a, uh, a terrific structure. Um, as, as Lynn has said, it had this beautiful uh, anatomy. You could just plonk your electrodes somewhere near CA3, CA1 fields, let the animal recover. And um, especially when we developed uh, microdrives, you could manipulate the electrode so that it was close to cells and you could record extracellularity from, from uh, the, the, the action potentials of pyramidal cells, was, as we now know. Um, and so when Dostrovsky and I did that, um, we started off looking at animals that were conditioned to run uh, to uh, water spouts and to press levers and things like that. But it very quickly became clear that if the cells were involved in memory, that wasn't the kind of memory uh, that they would be involved in, as, as Lynn has made clear. Um, we, to some extent, we were um, uh, influenced by the behaviorist uh, story. But having come from the psychological tradition, having been uh, at McGill with, with uh, uh, Hebb uh, at the same time that Lynn was there, I certainly was aware of a much richer psychological background and certainly aware of the, the, the work of Tolman and the idea that rats might have cognitive representations. So after much um, looking at cells and trying to figure out what they did, um, we came to the conclusion that the cells were responding not to anything the animal was doing, not to anything that it was learning, um, but essentially to um, where it was in, in the environment. And this is the paper we published. It was published on the basis of eight cells out of 60-some-odd cells. Um, they happened to be the, eight, the last eight cells that we looked at, because once we cottoned on to the spatial correlate, then all the rest of them had spatial correlates. Some of them fired in some places in environment, some fired in others. At the time, frankly, I thought, well, that's it. We've explained the hippocampus. It's something like Tolman's cognitive map. The, the story, which uh, the Strovsky and I put out there, to be frank, fell like a lead balloon amongst what was then, and to some extent still is, a very conservative scientific community. I mean, and what we were saying is, given that these cells seem to be responding to where the animal is, <coughs> perhaps what they're uh, taking uh, part in is a cognitive mapping structure. Perhaps they're uh, the, the cognitive map that uh, Tolman had postulated. And as I say, this met with deafening silence amongst all our colleagues. So it was with tremendous um, pleasure, I think, is, is the right word, and relief that I received a letter from Jim. Uh, I'm not sure he remembers this letter, in 1971, um, in which he wrote to me from Michigan and said, ha, we're both doing the same experiments. Um, and I've um, highlighted some of the aspects of them because I think they're particularly 
um, important. And I think they begin to get at some of uh, Jim's fantastic uh, qualities, which have made this field such a, a pleasurable field to work in. So Jim said, Jim now being the radical of a very conservative uh, uh, group of people uh, and willing to actually think about the sorts of things that we were saying, but also reflecting on his own work, which he was doing at the same time. Um, he says, I think, um, I think I've been seeing spatial um, cells just like you described, although you've examined that aspect of them rather more than I did. Um, He's also seen expectation cells. We reported cells which seem to uh, re represent what the animal expected to find in a particular location. Um, it's hard to, for me to know, given that Jim had recorded from 300 cells by the time we were recording from this small handful of cells, um, if I'm seeing the same kind of things you are uh, in, in, uh, other than spatial cells and expectation cells. Um, and he reported other kinds of cells. He said all of these cells that he's looking at had strong positional aspects. And he also said, there are all these other cells, which you seem to be ignoring, these what he calls specific performance cells, cells that I think, um, I'm not going to describe them, but I think um, they're, they're very much loved by some people in the field now, including Howard, who, uh, who I'm sure will tell you about Jim's um, spe specific performance uh, cells. But here's the, the opposite uh, sentence that I want to call attention to, it. if I can find the mouse here. There it is. I'm pleased to find someone else doing work that, had, that I'm doing and thinking uh, that we're finding agreement. Now, I put it to you that nobody in this day and age today would actually write to somebody saying, I'm really glad to see you're doing the same kind of work that I'm doing. <laughs> if anything, people would you know, say, get the hell out of this field. This is my field. What are you doing here? So that's one of the qualities which is Jim has sort of given to the, to the field. He has actually always been very generous, and I think the field has benefited enormously from that, from that generosity. Okay, I want to actually tell you a little bit about the correspondences between the cells that we were reporting and, and, and that Jim was seeing at the same time. First thing is that Jim looked at the differences between um, complex spike cells which are, turn out to be the pyramidal cells, and theta cells. And um, these are cells which um, are interested not so much where the animal is, but uh, what it's doing. So if the animal is running around, and Linus already alluded to <coughs> Rashjan and, and, uh, and uh, many of the other pioneers, uh, Case Van der Wolf, um, who studied theta at the uh, field potential level. So they, they looked at these uh, oscillations that you can see in the, um, in the uh, LFP uh, of, the, uh, of the hippocampus. And Case Vandal, in particular, described this, uh, the correlate of these oscillations, the theta oscillations, as being the animal um, moving around in, in an environment what he, and, and engaging what he called voluntary behaviors. So both our lab and, and, and Case's lab saw those uh, oscillations and also saw theta cells, which we call display cells, but Jim called them theta cells, and that's the name that stuck, um, which had a very nice phase correlation with that. And that was really reassuring. All of a sudden, the, the electrophysiological level of single cell recording was showing us something about the, uh, the LFPs that we didn't know before. Um, and just to note here, their, the relationship of these uh, cells to the EEG slow waves, as we call them, the animal's behavior, had been described already by, by Jim and, and by Fader and Ronk. And of course, the, that story has been taken up uh, with a vengeance by Yuri, uh, who I'm sure will tell us about it, and Peter Somerji. And uh, we still don't really know what the function of these oscillations are and the theta cells are. I mean, as Neil will tell you, um, there are ideas out there that you can use oscillations at different frequencies, which might contribute to the formation of, of the place cells. Okay, so we described several other kinds of cells. We described simple place cells, which you can see on the left here, um, are cells which fire when the animals are location, in this case, uh, in A, uh, in this part of the maze, and not in B and C, and fire as the animal runs from some other part of the maze to B and C. Jim was, respond, was re talking about the same cell types, I think. He was giving them different names and emphasizing slightly different properties of them. Uh, he called them approach consummate cells or approach consummate mismatch cells. 
And if you look at the quote uh, that I've taken from his paper here, um, it, he emphasized the fact that quite often these cells fired when the animal was approaching a particular location, particularly food location, but he also noticed that there were very strong spatial aspects of these cells, and, and sometimes the cells would even fire if the animal just laid in the place where the reward was. Um, and he, he said perhaps spatial characteristics are the entire basis of the firing of these cells. He also described a very, very important cell, and it was very important for us because we had seen the same thing, which were mismatched cells. And these were cells which fired maximally when the animal went to a location and couldn't, didn't get what it expected to get there. And, and this is shown here where an animal runs uh, to a location and uh, sniffs at the location because it's no longer getting a reward there. And interestingly enough, if the reward was there, the cells didn't fire so much. And here, Jim uh, actually tells you about uh, they fire often, rapidly, during unsuccessful behavior. So this was a cell which was actually signaling some mismatch between what the animal expected and what they did. OK, so as you will know, Nadell and I then took it upon ourselves to actually use these findings and many other things um, that uh, were known about the hippocampus to wrap this up into a very, very um, large-scale theory called the hippocampus as a cognitive map. Um, and we said the map consists of a set of these place cells, picking out the place correlate as the important correlate, um, which are wired together according to rules. And you can use a couple of stimuli to actually uh, drive the cells. But importantly, the cells were connected together by information about directions and distance of vectors. And so I have to say, at that point, I decided, yeah, if we're going to prove this theory, one way we would prove it is go and look for this information about the distance and the directions from one place to another. And I think I'm guilty of the story that the person who looks under the lamppost, because I kept looking in the hippocampus. I kept thinking, wow. Uh, they must be there. And every once in a while, you'd see a very small signal or something that looked like it might be that. Jim, of course, as I'll tell you in a second, uh, was much more adventurous. And he went looking in areas that were projecting into the... Um, and that's because he, as, as Lynn has already alluded to, he actually slowly um, became less conservative, I think, is the way, and said, OK, uh, if there are these place cells, what can we, we say about them? And he, he wrote us a letter um, in which he, um, he said various things. Uh, he said he's now th more enthusiastic about the, uh, the, the ideas in the book. Can I see him? Yeah. Um, and here's the operative thing. Uh, it's your style to be more speculative than I feel comfortable with. And I think that's perhaps... <laughs> that's Jim being very... Uh, <laughs> That's an understatement. Uh, <laughs> saying, God, I don't know how you guys can say these sorts of things. <laughs> um, and then he comes to the point where actually um, he says the, the thing that Lynn has already picked on. Just because you've got a bunch of spatial cells, you've got a bunch of place cells, that's not evidence for spatial maps, guys. We must know the behavioral correlates of things like the inputs, the enteroidal cortex, and the dentate before we can get to the, argue the function of the hippocampus from single cell data. And I think that's why he went to the subiculum and started looking for those other, other uh, inputs and, and found them. Before he did that, uh, he started doing place cell work with, um, with John Kuby. Uh, and this is a picture from um, a, a meeting that we uh, all went to at Ringbill Castle uh, in the early 1980s. And I, you should be able to in, uh, identify all of, the, uh, all of the culprits here. There's uh, Larry Squire. Uh, and who's that? Gary Lynch. Gary Lynch. <laughs> and myself. And who's that? David Gaffin. Pear Anderson. And Jim. Do you remember the Ringberg meeting? That was, it was, it was in a, uh, held in a, a, a castle which had been taken over by the Max Planck Society um, and had formerly been a, a, a rest home for, for Nazis. 
And so what they had done uh, when they took it over was to paint over all the swastikas that were throughout the building <laughs> and made them into some abstract symbol. So, of course, Gary Lynch at the time went around saying, look at this, look at these guys, they can't even paint it. I <laughs> How do they think they were going to beat us in the war? Anyway, at that meeting, Jim gave some of the first uh, evidence that these place cells operated in different environments um, and that if you recorded from a place cell in a female um, and asked her to retrieve her pups or to go to another place for water and so on and so forth, the cells would fire equally well in the correct place. Beginning to show that this was, in fact, a very abstract idea, which was not tied, as he had originally believed, to behavior. But most importantly, going out of the hippocampus to the retrohippocampal areas and to the subicular areas, um, he discovered the head direction cells. And this is the, the, uh, the reference to the, the first abstract that he uh, published in 1984. And I was in the lab at the time. I came to visit, and this is another story about Jim. I came to the lab, and Jim said, oh, I'm going to show you something, John, which is going to make you so happy. So here's somebody who's just made one of the major discoveries in neuroscience. And the first thing he thinks about is going to make me happy. I was going to say, Jim, Jim, you should be happy. <laughs> and I have to say, I think this is a major, major uh, discovery. I don't think it's been uh, rewarded properly uh, in, by our community and by the, the, uh, the, the rest of the world. Um, because it was, in fact, the first real evidence that there were spatial cells outside of the place cell. And of course, as you know, these are the, the converse of the place cells. These are cells which don't care where the animal is but care about the direction in which he's heading. So they provide a second really important spatial uh, story, and, and you can see them here. And of course, that the, the, the major, uh, uh, all of the evidence for these cells and their major properties were worked out by Jeff, um, shown here, relaxing with me someplace in the south of, uh, south of France, and Bob on a river cruise in, um, in, on the, the Vitava River in, in Prague. And here's, uh, the pictures from the meeting that celebrated Jim's discovery um, of, 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 of the head direction cell, the little tray meeting. This is the proper picture you get from the, uh, from the official report on the meeting. This is, of course, what the meeting was really like, uh, with Jim telling funny stories and, and all the rest of us laughing. Uh, laughing. And then finally, of course, uh, he and his colleagues, Bob, and uh, John Kuby went on to do quite a significant amount of work on the place cells, on their distribution, for example, as shown here. They introduced these color-coded maps, um, uh, and Bob insisted that they not follow the standard uh, uh, rainbow type of representation of, 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 uh, of um, false color maps. But they did show, importantly, for example, that if you look in the cells in a, in a two-dimensional environment, they seem to not be located in any particular location, but it seemed to cover the entire. So to sum up, um, thanks partly to Jim and to and, and people at Downstate and to other people, um, including uh, people like Neil Burgess and, and others in the Lond London lab, we now think we have many of the, or most, or all, if, uh, if you get me on a good day, all of the cells which are needed to, to build the spatial map. Um, in addition to the place cells and to the grid cells, we think that um, boundary cells, which are cells which represent the animal's relationship and, and distance from significant landmarks in the environment, uh, contribute to the map. And of course, there are the spectacular grid cells found in the Moses lab, um, which until very recently we would have thought were providing something like the metric for the map. We're not so sure anymore. Here's a picture taken in, um, in the, uh, I guess it's about the 1990s. Do you remember, Bruce, when that was taken? It's <laughs> well, it's in, it's in a Q-controlled environment, and uh, here are five of the culprits involved in this whole story. Um, and I wanted to show it because Bruce and Carol have made major contributions to, our, to the story. I won't have time to say much about it. I'm sure Bruce will, 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 will tell us his, his, uh, his, his side of the story. So finally, Jim, uh, let me just say, this is a, a kind of a, a, a billet doux. Uh, it's been a pleasure and honor being your colleague and friend over the last, I guess it's 45 years. We've had the, the two of us have had the privilege, I guess we're the elder, the elder statesmen. Are we the elder? We're the elders. We're the great, great, great grandparents. <laughs> 
Um, we've had the pleasure of watching this field grow from the small interest of the tours into, I guess, what's a mega industry. For a while, it was a cottage industry. Now it's a mega industry. And I've always contended, and I've said this several times, and I want to repeat it, that the bonhomie and the friendliness which characterizes the hippocampal field has in large measure to do with your own generosity and your uh, personality and your generosity of spirit. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and we look forward to many more uh, years to do it. Thank you very much. One of the uh, very embarrassing things that I've had to face over the last 30 years is when people have said, Jim Ronk was involved in discovering place cells. I was not. I, I did, as, as John talked about various times, work that was intermi intermixed with it. But yes, I saw placey kind of things, but I completely misunderstood it. So I did not get the picture at all. And indeed, for a few years, I think I was uh, contributed to an, op an opposing point of view which may, I may have contributed to the place cell idea not catching on. <laughs> and all right, I got and let me, let me, no, I'm going to get this talk all go. over again. <laughs> well, <laughs> but at any rate, I, but what has happened to me is one that probably will never happen to anybody, anybody here, or I hope probably nobody else, is people have given the idea that I was involved in discovering place cells. And indeed, I've had to, uh, <clears throat> so someone wrote a, a textbook chapter, I just happened to see it before it came out, which said that, and I had to call her and say, no, I wasn't, you have to take it out of the textbook. <laughs> and Eric Kandel thought I was involved in uh, discovering them, I had to call him up and say, no, or a conversation with him, no, that's not the case. If Eric thinks it, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I doubt if anyone else has been the circumstance of having to d deny <laughs> they were involved in things. Most scientific arguments or many uh, involve some of somebody saying, no, no, I should get more credit for this. But in this case, it's quite the opposite. And, John has just contributed to that misconception. <laughs> <laughs> this is another